Medieval legend tells us that King Arthur received the sword Excalibur from a magical lady of the lake. In other versions, he pulls the sword from a stone. Well, what if this legend is based on facts? A recent discovery might make you believe. October 2019, near the Verbas River in Bosnia, archaeology professor Ivana Panzik is studying the ruins of a medieval fortress. But the discovery of a relic under the choppy rapids shocks Panzik and her team. It's a sword lodged straight into a stone in the riverbed about 36 feet below the surface. Despite being down there for probably hundreds of years, the sword is remarkably well preserved. We did several dives to decide what we're gonna use during the excavation. The whole process of excavating the sword took us two days. The team manages to free the blade, but how this sword got in this stone in the first place is a mystery. Could it be the very Excalibur from the King Arthur legend? No concrete evidence exists that a real King Arthur actually ruled parts of England, beyond what was written about him centuries later. Some historians think he could be based on a real 5th century Romano-British leader named Ramathius, who fought invading Goths. Details are scarce, but even if Arthur is entirely fictional, could the story of Excalibur have inspired medieval copycats? It's possible that if this legend of King Arthur did make its way into Bosnia-Herzegovina, that individuals were attempting to recreate this story, to encase a sword in stone so that the rightful heir of this kingdom could pull the sword out in the same way that King Arthur did. Or maybe it's the other way around. Could this real sword in the stone be the inspiration for the King Arthur legend? So the big question is, could a sword really penetrate a rock? Look, that's a tough one. Most rocks are much harder than any pointed steel blade. So how can we explain this strange find? It's time to convene our own Knights of the Round Table. Maritime archaeologist Peter Campbell says, based on the testing done by the museum in Bosnia, the dates don't line up for it to have belonged to King Arthur or to have inspired his legend. This sword dates to the 13th to 15th century AD. The legendary King Arthur predates this sword by nearly a thousand years. So we can definitely discard the notion that this sword is in any way Excalibur. And what about the notion that the nobleman of the nearby fortress could have an Arthur copycat? Yes, it would be strange to do such a thing in a river, and Campbell agrees. One hypothesis that's been raised is the sword was put in the stone deliberately as part of some sort of king-making ceremony. We can effectively discard this notion because the sword was found at 36 feet, which is far deeper than they would have been able to dive in the 13th to 15th century AD. Still, he believes, based on what he sees, the sword belonged to someone important. We can see that it is finely crafted. It was very expensive metal used in its manufacture. And all of that indicates that this was probably the sword of a noble person. And that leads him to think there is some ritualistic reason it's in the water. There's actually a very well-developed tradition, especially in Europe, of discarding of swords and armor in rivers, lakes, and bogs. And this dates from the Bronze Age all the way up through the medieval period. If somebody wins a major battle, they can discard the sword into the river as some sort of ritual offering. And as to how it ended up lodged in the stone. Frequently, we see heavy objects deposited in rivers that work their way down with the current into sediment or into rocks. And then it has many centuries of wiggling and burrowing down into the cracks. The metal is also corroding, attaching it to the rocks, and sediment is filling in, and it's becoming rock itself. This explains why the sword appeared to be stuck in the rock. In fact, these are normal site formation processes, as we call them, for river environments. So, our verdict? This is a geological phenomenon. The sword didn't penetrate the stone, the stone built up around the sword. However, the sword's true origin and owner still remain a mystery. Perhaps it was wielded by another legendary king. 2007, near Traverse Bay, Michigan. Underwater archaeologist Dr. Mark Holly and his team of divers are scouring the lake bottom. 
we were out looking for a specific shipwreck. It's just flat sand for as far as you can go. And it's just very eerie. Instead of a wreck, they stumble across something much older. At first glance, it's just a line of stones. But Holly says there's more to it. I knew that we'd found something that shouldn't be there, but we had no idea what it was. One set of stones forms a circle. And strangest of all, look at this. One of the stones appears to have a detailed carving of a mastodon, here outlined with red chalk. Holly estimates the site was constructed around 10,000 years ago, before the glaciers melted to create the lake. Of course, Holly's video goes viral. Almost immediately, people described it as a fake. Nothing like this had ever been found in the Great Lakes before. Real or not, the discovery becomes known as the Lake Michigan Stonehenge and raises the question, was it made by the same people who built England's famed structure? Professor of anthropology Michael Masters raises a controversial theory that ancient Europeans migrated to the Americas long before Columbus. This tool technology associated with groups largely in France indicates that they came across between 20,000 and 15,000 years ago. Paleolithic Europeans in America? While some scholars are open to the idea, others point out that ancient Native Americans created their own astounding sites, like those of the mound builders in the Mississippi Valley. So who made it and how? And what does it mean? One more thing to ponder. There's a region known for strange disappearances and anomalous sightings called the Lake Michigan Triangle. Early reports put the find there. But Holly now says it's north in Grand Traverse Bay. So what do our experts have to say about this fascinating find? First, we ask archaeologist Peter Campbell if this could all be a hoax. He points to the moss and algae on the stones. If they had been placed recently, then there would be no marine growth on them whatsoever. The formation as well appears to be a genuine archaeological site. Campbell thinks the find is ancient and man-made. And if the mastodon carving is real, it might provide a window into a long-lost culture. It's possible that this really had some sort of religious connotation and perhaps a religious offering or ritual related to the hunt. But still, how did they carve that image into granite rock? Anthropologist Kathy Strain says it would have been difficult, but very doable. So in order to make a petroglyph, it's a very simple process. It is taking a rock and pecking at the patina that's on the outside of the target rocks. Granite is a hard substance, but no special tools would have been needed. Um, rock art appears around the world using a similar method, and none of those people had anything other than a rock. As far as comparisons to the English Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a group of rocks put into a circle for a religious purpose. And we're very heavy to move, and we are still not entirely certain how they accomplished it. The rocks at the bottom of Lake Michigan are more in a line. Take another look at the arrangement of the Lake Michigan stones. Strain says it's very revealing. This is likely what we call a drive line. And you use it to herd animals into either over a cliff or into some kind of fenced area. So it's a very efficient way of hunting. It would be the oldest drive or hunting line ever found when the glaciers melted more than 10,000 years ago. They submerged the site at the bottom of Lake Michigan, preserving it to this day. And Campbell thinks it could be groundbreaking in other ways. If this is, in fact, a mastodon drawn on this rock, then it is a monumental discovery, because this would be the earliest Paleo-Indian art that's been discovered so far. Our verdict? Well, Mark Holly definitely discovered something man-made. We think by early Native American tribes, not early European immigrants. But whether it was built for hunting or some other purpose, we can't know until it's studied further. It's February 2022 outside the city of Evora in Portugal. A man who's from out of town sightseeing sets out to explore the area from a bird's eye view with his drone. His aerial videos show a grouping of large gray boulders in a clearing surrounded by trees. The stones are arranged several rows thick in an oblong oval shape. 
Closer up photos from the ground show that the boulders stand on end at various heights. Journalist Eric Grunhauser says this strange site is known as the Almendres Cromlech. Cromlech means circles of stone and almendres from the Portuguese word for almond referring to the stone's shape. This collection of some 93 standing rocks is thought to predate Stonehenge by around 2,000 years. So this Portuguese formation is actually much older and much more mysterious. It's believed that the main design of the Almendres Cromlech was completed by about 5,000 BC. That makes it more than 1,000 years older than the pyramids of Giza, Stonehenge, and the earliest known permanent urban settlements on Earth. Who could have built the structure and how? Without technology like the wheel, moving these stones would have been near impossible for normal humans. It's believed that the first wheeled vehicle wasn't even invented till at least 3500 BC in Mesopotamia. So the mystery about these stones deepens. They're so heavy that it's hard to believe that without some system involving wheels, pulleys, that these stones would have been able to be brought to standing. Another strange thing, the site had been forgotten for centuries. It was only discovered back in 1964, and there are no records to indicate what its purpose was. Some wonder if it has some celestial significance. These standing stones are arranged in such a way as to align with the sun, the moon, the stars. On the winter solstice, the shadows that they cast actually point directly to another standing stone some two kilometers away. Since some of the stones bear unusual carvings, others suggest the Cromlech might have served a more religious function. Could a large flat stone found in the middle have been used as an altar to carry out ritual sacrifices? Recently, another standing stone structure was discovered in Jordan that's thought to be even older at an estimated 9,000 years old. Believed to be a sacred site used by a Neolithic hunting group, it doesn't have the astronomical precision of the Portuguese site. So is the Almandres Cromlech the oldest known application of astronomy in the world? If so, where could this knowledge of the stars have come from? Let's ask the experts. Anthropologist Kathy Strain says it's likely these Neolithic people achieved this huge feat with some ingenuity and a lot of sheer willpower. It is theorized that they would take logs, use rope, they likely used their cattle to help pull the stones along. After it gets off one log, you run it up to the front to put it in front of that, and so on. Yet how were these prehistoric people able to so precisely place these stones? Did they have some secret celestial or spiritual knowledge? Most experts think the alleged sacrificial altar is just a knocked over boulder that's been chipped away at over time. But archaeologist Dr. Ed Barnhart believes the stones could have had some ritual significance. Perhaps it's uh, astronomer priests who are watching the cycles of the heavens. They were putting them in the ground in an arrangement that was based on watching the sun rise and set over a year. In addition to lining up with the solstice on the vernal and autumnal equinoxes, the sun and moon rise and set over exactly the same points on the monument's axis. And Barnhart says this configuration may have served a very practical purpose. Once you're a farmer, you've got to know when to plant and when to harvest and when to do it again. That's that cycle. So these stones acknowledging the solar year are at least related to agriculture. Moving from a nomadic existence to a more sedentary one allowed people to observe the cycles more precisely. And interestingly, it's one of several sites throughout Europe. And though Barnhart says they were probably for farming, they also might be early art. They go from the Netherlands all the way down into the Mediterranean. I think that these stones are early man's attempt at immortality. People said, let's do something so amazing that people well after we're dead will remember it and admire it. But what they called themselves, it's hidden to history. Our verdict, these images likely show a celestial calendar, a 
sort of giant sundial for seasons rather than times of the day. Whether its purpose was astrological, agricultural, or simply artistic is lost to time. It's October 2021 near the Taima Oasis in northwest Saudi Arabia. Photographer Satish Javaili is trekking through the remote desert area to document a magnificent sight. His shots show a monumental rock formation in the shape of a rounded rectangle. It appears to be a manadnock, which is an isolated mass of stone. The 18 by 27 foot ochre colored slab is covered in prehistoric petroglyphs of horses, camels, and hunters, shown in stark relief and detail. But these 4,000 year old drawings are not the most notable feature of this formation. That honor is reserved for a perfectly precise crevice that divides the rock in two. The crack is so straight and exact that it seems impossible it could be natural or even man-made without the most advanced precision tools. What's even more remarkable is that each half is balanced precariously on a pedestal, yet the formation remains standing after millennia. Satish says he's never seen anything quite like it. It is simply mind-blowing the way the rock has been split the archaeological uh, specialists have gone there but nobody has come out with the right answer the large solid boulder looks as though it was split in half with the aid of a precision laser it's hard to believe this perfect crack down the middle could have been accidental so there are a couple of things i want to show you with the al nazla rock first of all this pedestal right here this pedestal right here built for monuments to rest on, right? Take a look at the line down the center. How does this happen? If you had a stone saw, could you cut the stone that perfectly? Again, there are petroglyphs all through this rock. This rock was created hundreds of thousands of years ago, and it has certainly spawned wild and amazing stories. Journalist Eric Grunhauser says one theory is that the people who drew the glyphs 4,000 years ago also split the rock. But did they have advanced enough technology at that time? The ancient cultures of the area were working with much more rudimentary tools than one would expect to be able to create something with such precision. It's almost as if someone would have had to have had a laser or some sort of highly, highly precision saw to create this sort of break. There was a nomadic people roaming the Arabian desert a few centuries later who were known for their engineering skill. It could have been created possibly by the Nabataean people, same culture that created the Petrocyte in Jordan, whose knowledge and expertise would have possibly been advanced enough to create something with such precision as we see in the Al Nazla formation. But even the Nabataeans didn't have access to high-tech tools like laser cutters and circular saws. So the exactness of the cut has led some to speculate it could have been made by advanced ancient visitors from another planet. Is it possible that the al Nazla formation was created by extraterrestrials? Was it left as a gift, not unlike the monolith from 2001, A Space Odyssey, to push humanity forward, to inspire us? As early as the 5th century BC, the Nabataeans began carving elaborate multi-story building facades into the red sandstone cliff faces of Petra. But that site is in Jordan, 450 miles away from the Al Nazla rock, and it involves more complex carvings than a single straight line through one rock in the middle of nowhere. So that might be a stretch. Let's see what our experts can dig up. Physicist Matthew Shadagas investigates to see if the rock in El Nazla could actually have been made by man or aliens. So I've taken an image of the El Nazla rock and I've actually drawn two perfectly straight lines from my computer. And what you can see in several locations is that actually the rock pokes past the straight lines. So this gap is actually not perfectly straight. Humans could create cuts in rocks, and nearby civilizations here are known to have done that. No need for ancient aliens. Since the line isn't actually as perfectly straight as it looks at first, perhaps it was made by people from the region. Archaeologist Dr. Ed Barnhart says nearby ancient civilizations like the Egyptians had special techniques for cutting into rock without high-tech tools. The typical way that Egyptians would split a stone like this would be to get up on the top of it and 
peck holes into it in a line. Then, as they peck the holes deep, they then put wooden stakes inside each one of the holes. So the Egyptians would put the stakes in a straight line, like the one seen at Al-Nasla. And then they would water those stakes like you water a plant. When the wood expanded together as a line of stakes, they would pull the rock apart. And that split will travel through the whole stone and split it. But geologist Dr. Bob Anderson says there aren't any telltale signs of this construction technique that you would expect to see on the top or sides of the rock if the crack was man-made. There's no chip marks, there's no pieces. You don't even see fragments on the ground around it that would say that if you're chipping and, and breaking. So could this crack be caused by a natural disaster like an earthquake? I realized that this Medadnock or this isolated rock here is not isolated. There's almost a trail of boulders going back. They're all cracked at the exact location. You can see that the crack is a result of regional tectonic features. So Anderson believes the rock may sit on a fault line, and it's likely an earthquake or shifting tectonic plates created the crack not just in this boulder, but in other rocks along the same fault line. Or it could also be that the crack is a joint, which in geological terms means when a rock breaks naturally without displacement, it's rare, but sometimes the fracture can divide the rock in an unusually straight line. Another possibility is that freeze-thaw weathering may have caused the crack. But no matter how it was split in two, Anderson thinks erosion may have played a part in its near-perfect appearance. The reason it looks so clearly cut is because it's uh, been willowed out by the wind. It's being almost like sandblasted and polished, which has opened up that crack more. The ground around and under the boulder eroded so much that eventually it was left just resting on these two natural pedestals. Someday the forces of gravity will likely cause it to collapse. The Al Nasla rock has baffled scientists for centuries, but we think we finally found the true answer. Our verdict? Tectonic activity created a crack thousands or even millions of years ago. It was later perfected with erosion, which also made those pedestals the rock now rests on.